So thank you all again for uh, coming. Most of you I've seen before. Some of them are some of you are new to the the space here. So I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a introduction. My name is Peter Meissen. I'm the director of. Sort of, I wear two hats here. The the long term one is the director of the Global Energy Network Institute, a nonprofit that's been around 25 years since here in San Diego with a global mission of linking renewable energy resources around the world, linking wind, solar, geothermal, hydro at scale between countries globally. This is some work originally from the thinking of Buckminster Fuller. Our website is there. There's 5,000 pages of corroboration on that, seven Nobel Peace Prize endor endorsements, lots of covers of industry magazines, and uh, we'll take a little bit of the credit for what's going on in the world right now because all of you know that linking renewables is a good thing. Everybody goes, that's a good thing. Back 25 years ago, it was quixotic, and everybody would kind of go, nice job, Peter, good luck. But it is clearly an industry that that's now has momentum. It's a commercial industry. It's happening here right in our own, own hometown. It's happening around the world, but not at the speed and scale necessary to deal with some of the big problems of the planet. So... Another great idea of Buckminster Fuller's many decades ago was a thing called the World Resources Simulation Center. Back 40 years ago, 50, anyway, 1967, there's a, there's a dome in Montreal. You've all seen a geodesic dome before, maybe in playgrounds or the one that covers the South Pole installation. The biggest one ever built is in Montreal for the 1967 International Expo. And the World Resource Sim Center was meant to be in that dome in 67. He was way ahead of most of the people on the planet in terms of thinking because what he really said is we needed a place, a venue to bring people together, to grapple with the tough issues of our time, to surround us in those trends, those historic trends, in the projections going forward, and ultimately make more sustainable decisions quicker. So that was the mission then. That's our mission now. This is phase four of our process. Some of you participated. We uh, Three years ago, we had a prototype event in Oceanside. We, we borrowed a studio over at the New School of Architecture a couple of years ago to do a demonstration event. This is our phase four. We're thrilled to be here. Phase five is a much bigger facility, three times the size, digital floor, digital screens, and, and we were raising three, four million to do that. I'd uh, love to talk with you about that some other time. That is our website up there for the World Resource Sim Center. We do a lot of events. Uh, every month. This one tonight, it's our monthly green scene evening. So some of you are a member of that green scene community. It, what we call it, those are the organizations in San Diego that are working on sustainable, sustainability, the environmental issues, and the, the whole question that we ask is how sustainable are we? So we've done five months so far on water, coastlines, energy, transportation, and the question always was how sustainable are we? on our water issues. We're not on our transportation issues. There's a train wreck ahead on some of our transportation issues we found out last month. Uh, I'm not sure it's quite as relevant a question tonight. I think San Diego has grown in its sustainability, but I think the question we, we evolved it a little bit to say to be how sustainable and resilient are we? Uh, are there threats and risks to our economy? So that's sort of the, the question for the, the presenters this evening. I'm thrilled with both of them being here. I've, I've certainly been in here, my, my, been in San Diego my whole life. I met, met Christina a couple of years ago. Um, she runs the Mega Region Initiative for the Economic Development Corporation here in San Diego. Uh, and I'm just going to brief her bio. Uh, you go back to uh, Washington, D.C. and studied at the World Woodrow Wilson Institute of in, uh, Woodrow Wilson Institute. She was a legislative analysis in, analyst in Congress and the House of Representatives. Uh, she worked with the National Security Agency, so she was one of the ones. No. Uh, <laughs> National Security Council. All right. So was uh, a advisor on national security uh, many moons ago. Uh, also went to Paris to work at the International Energy Agency, which is the energy side of the OECD, and. Uh, uh, most recently is, is now the director of this three-region, mega-region uh, for, uh, um, for our San Diego, Imperial County, Baja region, and uh, thrilled to have you here. 
uh, Jerry Saunders, most of you know him, uh, has an incredible bio for our community. If there's anybody that really exemplifies service to San Diego, it's, it's this gentleman, whether it was police chief, right, for many, many years, started out on the beat, I think as a beat cop from what I recall, uh, uh, was mayor, and then in between there, was, there were stints at United Way, I think, right, running United Way. And, uh, and now he is uh, the president of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce. Both of them are clearly, I'm going to say, cheerleaders and advocates for our business community for our region. So that's their role. Uh, last week we had the economists in here, Alan Jin and Kelly Cunningham. You might recognize their names. They're two, they're two of the eight economists that you see every week in the San Diego Union uh, that are sort of opining on the, the questions of the economy. Uh, one of Alan Jin's uh, uh, monthly reports that he puts out is this, count, this leading economic indicators. And who's on number three right now? Patrick, scroll down just a little bit. Just take the mouse and scroll down a page. Oh, now you changed it. Yeah, no, scroll down, scroll down. And what's, what's, what he basically said last week was, so those numbers all have little pluses in front of them, which is good because these are leading economic indicators, right? You want to see them in the positive territory, now go down the graph. Scroll down. One more page. And so there's the graph of our leading economic indicators all compiled together uh, for the last, since our downturn, you know, since the bottom. So it's, we've been in a nice slow up curve for our economy based on those five, six indicators. And uh, uh, it's, that's just the stats, right? It's just data, not opinion. And so that's a nice trend to see for our community. Uh, number two up here, I'm sorry that it's blue. It's not meant to be that way. It's hard to see. That monitor just went out about two hours ago. But it's a, it's a great graphic from uh, the San Diego Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's your, your report that you put out about the business report for the Chamber of Commerce. The top general business promotions, looking at the questions, these are five questions they ask. What were important? What was important was repairing streets and maintenance and infrastructure, a business community having a stronger voice at City Hall, a business community having a stronger voice in Sacramento, a more reliable water supply for the region, and greater energy reliability and cost stability. And you can see that a lot of people said it was extremely important and very important for those five questions. So that's straight out of the Chamber of Commerce website right now. Um, Christine will talk about this three-county region in a little bit. Her asset map, there's a great tool that they've got now, a, a very sophisticated, uh, G, I'm going to say a GIS asset map of the, the countries, the, the, the companies in our, re, in our region in many different sectors. And who's on 11 right now? Who? Eleven's over there. You move this, Timothy, what did we move to? Click back on, uh, oh, that's, that's all right. No, you're, you're fine. That, we're, you're, you're, we're on Genie up there, so that's fine. So we're, that's, that's a quick introduction of what we wanted to at least show you before we got into the conversation. Christina has a, a PowerPoint that we need to take just a second to set up. Paul Michael, will you switch those to um, open the open that no no mark them. <laughs> Give me one minute to set this up. Oh, yeah. No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I just took a little while to get it in the right spot. And we should start to see that. Now go to that other PowerPoint that we had set up here. There we go. There it is. It's coming. I doubt that was your first slide, was it, Christina? Um, no. Let's go. You probably go. There we go. So page up and page down is right there. Okay, okay? you're the guy. All right. right. Yeah. Okay. That. And, and you may Christina and you may want to back up a little bit. Do a, she'll do presentation. Because yeah. you see you on the corner. After, and then we'll have see you on the corner uh, of the screen. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Look into the light. Look into the light. There you go. Um, my name's Christina Loon. Um, I am executive director of the Cali Baja Binational Mega Region. 
and I'll I'll get into that a little bit more um, as we go along. So I'm understanding now what it is that you guys want to know from me, and that is kind of this bigger picture idea of 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 our economy, of kind of our broader economy and the global challenges that exist and how we're addressing them. And what he didn't tell you was that I taught um, while I was in graduate school and afterwards. So I, so my natural inclination now is to treat this as a graduate seminar. So I apologize in advance. That's why I move around. It's, it's to keep everyone from looking down at their their you know texting and their cell phones and everything else. So. Um, Okay, so this picture that you see is, and many of you may have seen this, so I don't know how much you follow border issues or travel to Tijuana or anything like this. This is a picture taken from, from in Tijuana, looking across to San Diego, as you can see. So, sorry about that. And um, so this picture was, was um, commissioned by the Tijuana EDC, also called DATAC, to show the growth that that from certain angles there's no there's no space between them that, that it's one continuous city um, and the point of this is to kind of really get you to think about um, what our economy is and what are the threats to it and what are some of the opportunities that we have and so from my perspective, I mean, when I started at this job, I hadn't actually hadn't been in San Diego that long. I, I grew up in Kansas, and and you know, lived other places before. Um, and you know, no one ever feels sorry for you when you move to San Diego because you got married, your husband works there. Um, you know, they don't. Um, but if your background is international, it's not the center of international development. And so um, I was very excited because A, it was San Diego, and B, I had just gotten married. And C, well, there was a border here. And I thought, wow, that's great. You know, growing up in Kansas, a long way from any border, I'm like, this is really exciting. And then I find out pretty quickly that there are a lot of people who don't see that border as something really exciting. Um, so fast forward to a couple of years later and I start working at the EDC and this opportunity to begin working kind of from the ground up on this project emerged. And as I told someone the other day, I said, I get to go to another country almost every week, you know, in my job. I'm like, how cool is that? Uh -huh. um, but it is an opportunity. I mean, if we were doing a sweat analysis, sweat, SWOT analysis, um, there are of course, challenges along with that, but there are huge opportunities. So one of the things that I, I, I talk about a lot is globalization and what that has done um, to the world, to the United States, to California, to, to San Diego, and why, why my organization got involved in doing this thing called the mega region in the first place. So, as I said, you know, San Diego's lovely, but believe it or not, there are a lot of places around the world that don't even, that don't know much about San Diego. Um, and when they do, it's 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 a limited way. And if you look at the very things that make this city so beautiful, this gorgeous coast, in some ways, it's a it's a limitation too. You know, we're kind of, some people think of us as the cul-de-sac or the very end, you know, we're of, of the United States, the southwesternmost corner of the United States. Um, an advantage, but also a disadvantage as well. From an economic perspective, we don't have a lot of rail here. So, when I got involved in this project and started learning about, and, you know, the value of, of of being on the border and how working across the border could be, it was, it was, you know, the economy was still roaring, but you could already look into the distance and see, because the economy was roaring, the cost of, of, of oil. And so if you're shipping products from China to the United States, you could already begin to see companies 
even at the height of the economy, beginning to think, wow, um, for the products that I make, some of the companies, that makes sense. So when you think about you know, why companies are beginning to rethink their strategy, their global strategy, you can see you know, all the companies that went to China, well, a lot of them are beginning to think differently now. And it's not just now the cost of, of, of moving goods. It's also labor costs. So Mexico is really an opportunity, a challenge, and, and I'll address that in a minute, but an opportunity as well. So some of the competitive industries that exist across the border, electronics, the medical device manufacturing, if you were to take the manufacturing across the border and combine it with the broader life sciences on this side, we're one of the largest in the, in the world. And many of these companies have cross-border cross relations, which makes them, you know, which these ties that bind them makes us even more competitive. You know, my background was not in business, and it certainly wasn't in manufacturing. I've learned a lot about supply chains. And one thing that's happened, and was happening before I started on this, was this move to just-in-time manufacturing. I mean, I'd heard these terms, but I didn't know what it meant. Just-in-time manufacturing means all those warehouses up and down the border that were built for when people would keep lots of, of, of product there waiting to send off, they don't do that anymore. So just-in-time manufacturing shortens that supply chain too, and you're looking for the, the shortest supply chains that you can get. When you look at the employment and where we are, and you, and you look at what Tijuana has to offer, and that's just Tijuana, you begin to see the value. Again, it's, a, it's another opportunity. Everything has opportunity costs. What are we not getting? What's the, what, if, we, if we work across the border, what's the downside to that? So one of the reasons that I talk about Mexico so much is because Mexico has had <coughs> not the greatest press in the last five, six, eight years. I mean, actually you can go on and look on and on. And some of that is legitimate. I mean, let's be honest. There have been a lot of challenges across the border in the whole country. Um, but without belaboring that, it, the progress that they've made as a nation in kind of tackling <coughs> some of their problems, you can also see in terms of how important Mexico is to the United States. And I point this out because it is so important. 20 some odd states in the United States, Mexico is their primary trading. And, and when you think about that, in every state in the United States has some sort of trade with Mexico. And when, when we often think of trade, you know, it's like, okay, well, they, they manufacture all these cheap things and they come in to the U.S. Well, it's more than that, though, because we export a lot as well. I mean, trade is this give and take. It's the, it's the two sides. And that's important to understand how every state in the United States is tied to doing business with Mexico and has been for a long time. But now Mexico is becoming more important. So this is quite a little mega region here this entire U.S.-Mexico border. The 10 states that make up it, um, their combined GDP, depending on which, which group that you look at, IMF or World Bank, makes it, breaks it the fourth or fifth largest GDP in the world. When I mean, you think about that, 
it's an enormously important region for both countries. Economically important for both countries. And when you think about this, the trade, it's important to understand that six million U.S. jobs depend on trade with Mexico. And that's a lot of jobs. And that 40% of the content of U.S. imports from Mexico are produced within the U.S. So even if a, if a company is, is importing something into the U.S. and being sold, and a, a good portion of it was made in Mexico, many of the products that made up that were made in the U.S. and sold to that. So that's important, again, to, to understand the interconnected nature of trade and how important Mexico is to the United States, to, to California, to, to us right here. Now, you couldn't not turn on the news and hear about the problems at the border in terms of border weight times. How many of you have crossed the border in the last year? How many of you have a century pass? So, for those of you who didn't have a century pass, how was the crossing? Oh. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, and that's just as a, either you cross as a pedestrian or in a car. car. Okay. So, so but it, the commercial element of this is really important to understand what that means as well. Because people coming across the border, whether they're in their cars or going shopping or it's, it's, um, it's, it's the commercial element of that. If you've been to Otai and you see the, the trucks coming across, again, there are lost economic benefits. And that's very important to understand. When this debate about improving the infrastructure at the border, who, you know, who's going to use that, really how important is it to us? Well, and I, I, I give Marnie Cox credit on this. I was at an event recently and I said, oh, I want to be able to use this slide because it really helps capture what this means in lost economic output. For the men who pay attention to Super Bowls, um, you can see the 18 Super Bowls. You can see four Google companies, the, 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 how this translates. But what people often don't understand is it's not just the trucks. Many of the folks sitting at the border are coming across to shop, so it's a huge impact on, on shopping. It's cheaper to buy goods in the United States than it is to buy it in Mexico because they don't have the value added tax. We don't have the value added tax. So there's a tremendous amount of shopping that goes on here. And, and if you're sitting in that border, wait time, and it's several hours to get across, and then you know, guess what? Sometimes you have a, a southbound border weight too becomes becomes problematic. So globalization, you know, really, I was talking about this with a colleague. Globalization is a process, you know, of of the world becoming interconnected, and you can go back heck. And you know, we were talking about well, when when did it really start? You know, did it start with with um, you know, with Marco Polo, with whoever. I mean, you can go back and, and trace what we think of as globalization back really to the earliest movement in, of humankind. But what's happened in the 20th and 21st century is the acceleration of that. The rate of change is so fast. And so what does that mean? I mean, we hear this term all the time, globalization. Well, globalization, beyond just this interconnectedness, means it's not just that people now, well, whoever is listening in, we won't, we won't address that, um, but our ability with, with technology to be in contact virtually immediately with anybody around the world. Money can be transferred, language, I mean, you can, you can communicate with anybody. 
And so that has one of the most significant things that has changed the way we do business in the world. And think about the impact on business as well. So it's changed the market. We're no longer competing with, with the community next door. It is a global market. And that was accelerated by the end of the Cold War, the peace dividend. Now it opened up almost all the world for business, for labor. The only thing that can't move easily is labor. But money can, and companies can. You know, we're not talking about smokestack industries anymore. It's pretty easy for a company to kind of pack up and move someplace else. So it really is a global market. And, and that's important to understand. We today are in the midst of a process not dissimilar that took place a hundred years ago when America was really rapidly industrializing. Now, we all, you know, you all remember your, your high school and college history. So you know industrialization took place over a long period of time, and it impacted different countries at different times, and it impacted different sectors of, of, of what we would think of, of the economy, different work. It, it impacted them different times. So here we are today ex in experiencing the same kinds of things. You know, that genie in going back in the bottle. So we are a global economy. If you're a company now, you're not just, com you know, you're whatever it is that you make, you look all over the world for your, to who you're going to sell, whatever it is you do, and you think about who, who's my, who are my competitors? Well, you're competing with whoever can deliver whatever that profit is most effectively, the most efficient, efficiently, I won't say the cheapest, but obviously cost plays in there. And so the impact of globalization is really where we are today and why that is, makes having what we call the mega region so important. Now, Richard Florida, who actually was just in town a couple of weeks ago, um, for another event, talked about, he's not the only person who's, who talks about mega regions, but he's really kind of pushed it to the forefront and kind of moved it into popular culture. And so his, his thought is, you know, we, we no longer compete as um, nations anymore in terms of economics, that he sees it as economic corridors. These, these intense, densely populated regions around the world. And that's our competition. Now you think about it. America's big. I mean, yes, you know, we have a certain element of America's competing with others. But it's these intense, densely populated urban areas that spread from, from here, from Tijuana, all the way up past LA. That's considered one of the identified um, mega regions. So these are the, the mega regions that have kind of been identified in, in the United States. And you can see here in the corner, the left hand corner, the Southern California mega region, which we're part of. Now, you know, this isn't something that's agreed upon completely um, there are debates over, well, you know, what really is and what isn't. But there's some, some key elements to that. And, and the essence of this really is these, these densely populated corridors of urban areas where most of the economy is generated. I mean, so they're intense. And the way they kind of even thought about it was the original study was looking at the world at night. It was a global picture of light. Time. I mean, it's pretty fascinating to go and look, to read the original study. It's, it's in the little economic stuff, but, but so they, they took a picture and saw all these, 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 these light corridors and realized, well, wow, 
that's a you know I mean people are doing business there these are the these are densely populated areas and so then they started doing you know overlaying that on economies and figuring out how many people lived here what kind of what was the GDP of these areas I mean a whole range of things so you can see our mega region right here it's one of those fancy little slides where it comes in and out. So this is what we call our mega region, which is, you know, I've had discussions from the beginning with um, a variety of people. Well, we're not really mega region, we're like a mini region, but that doesn't sound as exciting as a mega region. And so we started this, the, the EDC that I worked at, um, we partner with Imperial County, which is the, the county due east, and applied for a grant from the federal government to kind of develop this strategy. How how would, in our case, a ur you know largely urbanized, knowledge-based economy partner with a largely rural agricultural economy that wants to transform their economy, not get rid of agriculture, but diversify it? And since both counties have really important economic ties south of the border, you know, let's throw that into the mix too. Because if we're going to develop a strategy, we need to include elements that are really critical to our economies. And you know, we got money to develop a strategy. And so we looked at this as much as anything else as a marketing strategy. Because I know for a fact that LA doesn't go out and market itself and say, you know, come to LA or San Diego. So it's as much about kind of putting a stake in the ground along the border and saying, we're open for business and here's what we have and here's why it's important. Because it's not about breaking off from, from the Southern California. Um, mega region or ignoring the importance of, the, of LA and Orange County's economy and, and the, how we fit into that. But rather it's about, again, sticking a flag in the, in the ground and saying, here we are, we're open together, we're going we're gonna to work together to draw attention to us, to bring companies here. Very early on, we figured out, well, actually, I mean, it kind of makes sense. We, we have complementary assets. Now, there's, you know, this has been reduced to kind of very kind of bare net. There's a lot of overlap, and as we've kind of gotten into this and understand that it's not quite as clear as this, but from um, a marketing perspective, it works quite nicely, and you can see what all three partners in this endeavor kind of feel like they have to offer. So now imagine, my organization originally got involved in this, because, and this is what I heard when I first moved to San Diego. There's no manufacturing left in, in well, heck, in the United States, much less here. There's no aerospace, and the, the cost of doing business in California San Diego is so so much that we don't really we can't really attract new companies here. We need to be able to grow new companies, which is actually very important, and retain the ones that we have. And so we originally started this as a retention kind of program. Because San Diego, as beautiful as it is and as big as a county it is, there's a lot of limitations to where you can expand your business, particularly if you're doing any kind of industrial expansion. So what happens when we run out or when that becomes so expensive that a company that's, a, that's been here for years starts doing the math and said, you know what, it, you know, there's not that much industrial, you know, land left. I need bigger land. It costs X. Texas out dangling, you know, come to Texas and I'll give you land or, you know, same thing with Arizona. You know, maybe they'll consider, if not moving everything, moving part. Once that starts, 
that's not a good sign. So we thought, well, we can't create new land, but what if we drew a bigger circle around our region and said, okay, so now this is our region. So look at all these other things that we have to offer now. Instead of just limiting it to San Diego, now if a company comes to us and says, you know, I just, it doesn't make sense. You don't have what I want. Well, what if, what if what they needed is Imperial County? Or what if what they needed is across the border? We would rather that company expand there than to Texas because we know that they'll come back if, they're, if it's in Mexicali or Imperial County or whatever, especially in summer, they'll all come back and spend money here. So that's a lot closer. So that was the original intent. Now that we've really kind of gotten into this after a number of years, we realize, actually, you know what? It's not just about a retention. It's about attracting companies here because there are these cost benefits, these other kinds of assets that we have that for, not for every company, it's not gonna make sense for every company, but there are companies, there are industries like the bio, life sciences, medical device, that makes sense. They want to be in a cluster. You want to be where your suppliers are. You want to be where the researchers are. And as, they, as many of these have expanded into things like um, more of the bio agra, I mean, you've got the opportunity to do larger scale, you know, scalable kinds of research in Imperial County. So, okay, so when we started, um, mind you, I didn't know what a cluster was. I have, I hate, I, I'm almost embarrassed to admit that. Um, but I now know. So. And um, we had to start with, okay, how, what kind of companies are we going to focus on? We can't do everything. We have to, it has to make sense. And so, fortunately, other people had done cluster studies, and so we kind of looked at, what is San Diego really competitive with, and then what is Imperial competitive with, you know, what makes sense for them, and then what do we know about the folks across the border. And so we developed, we started with four, and we have since re added agribusiness, but these are the five kind of strategic industries. There's a lot of overlap between these. Um, if you talk about advanced manufacturing, there's certainly plenty companies that fit in applied biotech um, that are both. I mean, same thing in clean tech. Um, but so these are the, the five that we said, okay, this makes sense from all of us as a, to go out and promote this bi-national region. And if, how many people have been to Imperial County? Recently? <laughs> Oh, come on. It's a dry heat. Um, so, renewable energy, you know, regardless of, you know, I'm not going to, we'll, we'll save that for another discussion about the merits of certain types of renewable energy. Think about it from Imperial County's perspective. They want to diversify their economy. They want to move off the reliance of, of agriculture and government and retail. Because those are the big you know, the big economic drivers. So what do you do? Well, what do you have lots of? You have land, you have sun, um, you have water, um, and so, and you have geothermal. All of the things to, that you can develop that you don't need all of it the, the way that other people do, and it's something that you can sell. So you can understand how how they became um, so committed to doing renewable energy. And it's one of the few places, if not really one of the only places in the world that we've figured out has all the kinds of renewable energy generation. It's pretty interesting. Um, I, I recommend that you all take a tour out there at some point. Um, you know, I've, I've been out there, so I've watched all the stuff being built. It used to be just kind of, you know, I would take people out there and be this great big empty 
you know, sand area and say someday, you know, there's going to be a solar farm here or someday there's going to be this. And now you can see it. I mean, now, it, it, oh, yes, there you go. Okay. Um, so it's one more, you know, arrow in our, you know, quill of economic tools that we have, and now that I've kind of completely mixed my metaphors. <laughs> uh, um, but you think about it, it, it there, there was a lot of debate, so I was at an imperial during this, and I, I raised this because, because any time we move into a new industry, or there's always opportunity costs, there's always challenges, and that's important to understand. There were heartfelt folks who stood up and said, you know, you know, why would we want to do this? It's pristine land. And, you know, the reality is, from an economic development perspective, and that's how I see it, I see all of the arguments, but I, I treated it as, what are the chances of Imperial County having other opportunities to begin to really diversify their economy? You know, there's less than 180,000 people in Imperial County. So, I mean, the good news is it doesn't take a lot of new jobs to begin to really start seeing some differences. And it's not that these jobs, once the construction is over, it's not that they're huge job generators. You know, there aren't a lot of Googles out there anywhere that are going to go anyplace. But what you have, and this is how real hard economic development works, and that is, once you start getting more and more of these projects built, and it's a handful of jobs here that will be permanent, and a handful of jobs there that will be permanent, the more of these different types of, the more, the more solar that you have, and the more of all these different have, then you can begin to start attracting suppliers. More jobs. With the, with the possibility of doing some of the manufacturing. And that's how long-term economic development works. So it is a long-term strategy. And I, I give that as an example because it's a very kind of concrete, easy one to see it kind of play out over the, the last five or so years. Okay. So um, one of the things that we've done together Three regions, six economic development organizations have really kind of worked hard um, to go to trade shows, to, to, to develop collateral materials, and to really kind of develop our, this kind of this first um, economic development tool. So we have a very kind of basic website, and in it, if you look across the top, you see asset map. So calibaha.org is, is the website. Um, we've been developing these other tools on the back end. I don't, you know, this isn't my field of expertise. Again, I've learned more about some of the stuff than I care to. Uh, one of the young women I work with says, oh, wow, this is going to be great. You're going to be able to put all this stuff, you know, learning how to build it, you know, databases and websites and all this stuff. You're going to be able to put all this stuff on your resume. I'm like, I don't know. I never want to do this again. <laughs> um, never. So, but it's a, but it's a, it's a tool that, that all of the, the economic development organizations and others are going to be able to use. So it, it has on the, the asset map built into it. It's actually a series of maps. And we've used um, Google Maps as our base. And I've since come to understand why we did this. And it makes actually a lot of sense. Um, if you actually look over there, that's, that's the map live. Um, so we have a choice of cluster map, toggle map, and layers that are put on. And so again, we've got the five um, industry, kind of strategic industries that we've chosen to focus on. 